Hello, chefs. This is Chef's PSA Podcast. I'm your host, Andre Natera. On today's episode, we're going to talk all about tips and tricks from Chef's PSA that you can incorporate in your kitchen. Stay tuned. So before we get started, if you want to support the show, you know what to do. Make sure you leave five stars. Nothing less than five stars. If you're watching on YouTube, hit the subscribe button, turn on the little bell for notifications. And of course, go to chefspsa.com where you can get all the books that I sell, including the free eBooks as well. Culinary Leadership Fundamentals, probably the most important book of all of them, followed by Bad Sue, Good Chef. If you're a new sous chef, this is your mentorship book that you need. Kitchen Art of War for the Strategist. Line Cook Survival Manual for all the new line cooks and how not to be the biggest idiot in the kitchen. Well, basically for idiots in the kitchen. Anyway. We digress. I briefly want to talk about a podcast that I was on recently, one of my friend's podcasts called Proper Thieves. It's a great podcast. It's about an hour and a half long. I'm going to link it in the show notes. Go listen to it or go watch it on YouTube. Proper Thieves podcast. About half of the podcast is chef stuff and the other half of the podcast is just random things. Everything from UFOs to MMA fighting to creative habits to morning routines. It's a great episode. I really enjoyed that interview. Go give them a follow and go listen to that one. I was happy with it. I thought it was pretty good. I found it rather entertaining. I put a couple of clips up on Chef's PSA Instagram so you get an idea of where it's going. Speaking of tips, on today's Chef's PSA Instagram post, I didn't do my typical fortune cookie post. I did something a little bit different. I asked for pro tips from the industry. What are some of those little pro tips that you guys know that everyone should know? And I think it's a pretty good thread. You should go look at it. There's a lot of really good information on there. So all the people that commented on it, thank you so much. Save that for future reference because it's like a little hub of knowledge. So what inspired that is that I knew I was going to record this podcast. I want to give a shout out to Alec Costilla who inspired this podcast. We were talking and he wanted me to do an episode on little tips and tricks in the kitchen. Things that I've shown him that he thinks all chefs and cooks should know. So little things sometimes make a big difference in the kitchen. It's all about attention to detail. And so everything I'm going to talk about today, I think are simple things that you could incorporate into your kitchen practice that would make your life a little bit easier, make your food just a little bit nicer. And maybe you know some of them, maybe you don't. I'll do my best to explain them so you understand. But if I gloss over a topic quickly, Feel free to comment and I'll try and expand upon it. Let's start with the first one, the cryovac machine. Now, I think the cryovac machine is one of the most important pieces of equipment in any kitchen. But unfortunately, most people just use it for cryovacing and it could do so much more. The obvious first thing you could use it for is sous vide cooking, putting things under vacuum, extending the shelf life of your product, minimizing space in the cooler. You know, if things are nice and neatly organized in vacuum packed bags, make sure they're labeled and dated. You could put things away nicely. Now, there are some safety precautions that I think people need to be aware of when vacuum packing things. Make sure everything's nice and clean. Make sure you clean your cryovac machine and make sure it's sanitary. But what are some cool things that you could do with your cryovac machine? One, one thing that I do is I compress spinach. Now, if you've ever bought bags of spinach, you know how much space they take up on your line. They're huge. But if you toss the spinach with a little bit of olive oil, put it inside the cryovac bag and cryovac it in the machine, obviously you're going to reduce the amount of fluff in the spinach by about 10 times, which will then take up much less space in your reach-in or your walk-in or wherever you're storing your spinach. This is assuming that you're going to cook it, right? If it's for a spinach salad, probably bad idea, don't do that. But when the spinach gets compressed, it also kind of gives you an idea of how much spinach you need to grab to saute because everyone knows that when you're sauteing spinach, you could start out like with a pan that's overflowing and you end up with like a spoonful. So cryovac in your spinach not only saves space, but it also gives you a better gauge on how much spinach you're gonna need for a specific dish. You could also cryovac microgreens, herbs, things like that. What I do is I put them in containers with ice water and then I cryovac them and that sort of quickly opens up the cells. So if you've ever put scallions or bell peppers or just fresh herbs in ice water, you see how they get crisp and firm up. Well. Immediately putting them in the cryovac machine will open them up even more and allow you to use them immediately. Now, they do take on a little bit of a translucent color as it breaks the cell walls. But the reason I like this so much is because they last way longer. If you've ever had some microgreens on the line, you know that they wilt by the end of service and you got to throw them away. So them in ice water will allow them to last. The other thing is if you work in a restaurant with heat lamps and then you garnish with microgreens, what you'll notice 
is that by the time you're finished garnishing and ready to sell the food, the microgreens have wilted. But if you compress them in ice water, they will still remain in the form that you want them. So they'll still have a little bit of structure to them. Game changing tip, trust me. If you haven't done it before, just try it. Everyone that I've ever showed that to, that for some reason is the thing that impressed them the most. So anyway, that's a game changing tip. Cryovac, your herbs in ice water. And by the way, I don't mean in a bag. I mean in an open container. So for example, you have a, a ninth pan or a deli container, fill it up with ice water, put it in the cryovac machine, and then compress your herbs, not in the bag. So I want to make sure that if I wasn't clear about that, we're clear now. A few other things that you could use those cryovac bags for is fermenting. So if you've ever read Noma's book, The Guide to Fermentation, they talk about fermenting in cryovac bags, and then you leave them out of room temperature and you burp them every couple of days and reseal them. Anyway, those cryovac bags come in handy for fermentation. If you're doing like a 2% salt fermentation, anyway, you could read that book. It goes into it in depth. But again, if you're using your cryovac machine well, not only could it increase the quality of your food, but it could extend the shelf life of your products through fermentation and pickling. So let's talk about pickling too. I cryovac my pickles all the time. So sometimes in a bag, sometimes just in an open deli container or a pan without the lid if I need them immediately. But cryovacing your pickles allows you to use them much quicker. So you don't have to wait 24 hours or 48 hours or whatever your pickling recipe calls for. Sometimes you can use them immediately. On top of that, compressing fruits and vegetables, infusing flavors, and the list goes on and on. I guess the point is, if you have a cryovac machine, use it for more than just sucking the air out of bags. If you're making a fluid gel, you might want to take the bubbles out. Another little tip. Sorry, I could I could talk about cryovac machines a lot. The next thing is something I call soigné water. So when I'm setting up my line, if I was a saute cook, or even sometimes just if I'm working the past, I always have a little squeeze bottle of clean water, distilled, filtered water, just something simple. And the reason I have that is throughout service, things tend to split, emulsions tend to break, fat starts to be released. So adding a little bit of water to things helps bring them back. So let's just use a hollandaise sauce as an example. If your hollandaise on the line is starting to split, you add a little bit of water and you continue to whisk, it'll bring it back together. If you're holding a very buttery palm puree on the line and you're starting to get a little grease ring around it, you could put it back in a pan, add a little bit of water. And again, I mean a little bit of water and stir it back up and it re-emulsifies the fat back into it. Another thing I like to use that water for is if maybe you're making a pan sauce or maybe you're making a sauce for pasta and maybe it's split. You could add a little bit of water if it got too thick or if you need to re-emulsify that pasta water and butter, olive oil, whatever the case may be. Maybe you left your little sauce pot of sauce and it reduced a little too much or it's a little bit too thick. Just adding a squeeze of water in there could hopefully bring it back to life. So having a little squeeze bottle of water goes a long way. I call it soigné water. I don't know what you call it. Maybe you just call it water. Anyway, that's a good little tip that I have in the kitchen. Have a squeeze bottle of soigné water on your station and use it for everything. Trust me. Once you start using it, you'll you'll wonder why you never did that before. The next one, I want to give a shout out to the team at the French Laundry in Per Se because I got this idea from them. Chefs Thomas Keller, David Breeden, the whole team at those restaurants. In the book, The French Laundry Per Se, there's a chapter in there on thickening agents and they talk about prehydrated xanthan gum. Now, this idea I had heard years ago, I think I read about it in David Chang's Lucky Peach magazine, where someone was making xanthan water to help glaze vegetables. I think it was Laurent Gras at L2O at the time. I think. My memory might be escaping me, but I think I read that Laurent Gras, when he was the chef at L2O, three Michelin stars at that time, was putting a little bit of xanthan gum in water and making xanthan water, keeping it in a squeeze bottle and helping it glaze vegetables. Adding a little squeeze to the saute pan gave it a nice sheen to the vegetables. So anyway, in the French Laundry Per Se book, the new one, they go over creating xanthan water. So the way that it's explained in the book, it's at 2%. So 2% for all-purpose xanthan water. So 1,000 grams of water, 20 grams of xanthan gum. Put the water in the blender, turn it on, shear in the xanthan gum, and you'll have this prehydrated xanthan gum that kind of looks goopy. What they advise in the book, and this is what I do also, I took the advice, is you put it in the cryovac machine to bring the bubbles out, which I talked about earlier or something that you could do. What you end up with is a very clear liquid, almost looks like, it almost has the look of glucose syrup. Anyway, you put that in a squeeze bottle or a container, how, whatever you use it for in the kitchen, and it becomes an all-purpose thickening agent for a lot of things. So what do I use it for? I put it in purees to help them from splitting. So if you've made vegetable purees, fruit purees, you know that sometimes when you put it on the plate, it leaves a very thin 
water ring around it if it sits for too long. So putting a little bit of that prehydrated xanthan gum in there will help the water from leaching out. It adds a little bit of structure to your purees. It helps emulsify things. It can help with stabilizing foams if you're putting things in an ISI canister or Izzy. I don't know. Izzy or is it ISI? I've, he I've heard chefs call it both things. They don't sponsor the show. So maybe if they did, I would know how to, I would know what the name is. But anyway, pre-high, as it's called in the book, coined by the French Laundry team, is basically pre-hydrated xanthan gum at 2%. Goes a long way. Full credit to those guys. When I read it, I definitely incorporated it into my kitchen repertoire when I was a chef. It is a game changer. It's one of those things, like I said, the bottle of water, bottle of pre-high goes a long way. It'll change the game. It'll make your sauces shinier, smoother, with a more beautiful texture. Assuming that you're using a nice Vitamix blender to make sure everything's nice and smooth. Anyway, we digress. And by the way, there's a lot of really good tips in that French Laundry Per Se book. One of the things that they talk about is the 211 pickles. So two parts water, one part vinegar, one part sugar, and they make a pickling brine and they use it for pretty much everything. So I, I love that idea. I love simple ratios in the kitchen. Things that it doesn't matter what it is. The 211 is the ratio. Got it. So we could change the aromats that are in there. We could flavor it differently, but that becomes the all purpose pickling brine for a kitchen. So what I do if I'm the chef is I will make 10 gallons or five gallons of all purpose pickling brine. And then as we're making pickles, we might just infuse it with some different aromats depending on what we're doing. But the pickling brine remains the same for pretty much everything. So again, ratios are a good thing to know. 211, two parts water, one part vinegar, one part sugar. That's the French Laundry Per Se recipe in that book, which I love. They also get into their Vet Blanc, which is a combination of ascorbic acid, sugar, and salt. And then they rehydrate it with water at 6%. And they use it as an all-purpose cuisson for everything that they're cooking. Maybe it's vegetables. Maybe it's you're cleaning artichokes and the artichokes are going in there so they don't oxidize. Maybe it's simply for compressing some lettuces or some cucumbers before you put them on a crudite or something like that. Anyway, endless possibilities with that. But I love those ratios and those little things are great tips. So shout out to those guys. Like I said, full credit to them. It's something that I read and then I incorporated it into my kitchen. I think they're good ideas and I think you should incorporate them too. Next tip I have for chefs and cooks is to have a finishing station. And what I mean by that is just you just have a couple of things on your station that are intended to finish the dish. So what do I have on my finishing station? I'll talk about it. I always have some sort of acid and that acid comes in different forms. It might be a good quality sherry vinegar or a Banyols vinegar or a champagne vinegar or something like that. It might be simply just some lemon cheeks. So if I just need a squeeze of lemon on top to bring some acidity or some brightness to the dish. But there is some finishing acid on my station to adjust the seasoning of whatever it is that I happen to be serving at the moment. There's also a high quality olive oil, something extra virgin, something flavorful, something that I know is high quality. I'm not talking about the stuff that you typically saute with. I'm talking about spending a little bit of money getting a good quality olive oil, having a nice little squeeze bottle on your station, and maybe you're using it to brighten things up before it goes out. You're drizzling it on some steak, on some pasta. It adds a little bit of sheen, it adds a little bit of fat, and obviously if it tastes good, it adds a ton of flavor. Maybe olive oil's not your thing, but a finishing oil on the line goes a long way to brighten up your dishes. The next thing I have on my finishing station is some sort of salt. Typically I use like a Maldon flaky salt or something like that. A little goes a long way. It adds some crunch. I enjoy finishing meat with it, sprinkling a little bit of Maldon salt on a sliced steak or a piece of duck breast or something like that goes a long way. It enhances the flavor. It adds a little bit of texture when you get into that crunch. And then of course, freshly ground black pepper. Not every dish needs pepper, but for those dishes that do need pepper, freshly ground goes a long way. I use a Peugeot pepper mill because I'm a pepper mill snob. You use whatever you want, but I'm a big believer in the freshly ground black pepper not to the stuff that comes in a container that's table grind. And the reason I, I'm not a big believer in that is because I think you lose some of the flavor in my experience. Some of the essential oils get lost. You don't know how long that's been sitting on the shelf. So I like grinding my pepper for finishing right out of the pepper mill on the steak or the chicken or the duck or the meat or the salad, whatever it is. I like to finish my food with that. So that's on my finishing station. Some sort of acid, vinegar, lemons, olive oil, finishing salt, pepper. And then obviously plate wipes, which while we're on the subject of plate wipes, everyone does their plate wipes differently. I like mine made out of torque towels or chick towels. Some people use a you know a big cloth. Other people I've seen get sponges and cut them up. I soak mine typically in vodka. Some people like to use vinegar. Some people just use water. Whatever it is, use a plate wipe because dirty plates are gross. So roll them up nice and tight. Don't serve 
food on a dirty plate. Chefs, come on, you know better. My next little tip is everyone should have a caviar key on their keychain. One, because it's badass. I have a caviar key on my keychain. You never know when you need it. It doesn't take up much space, but when you do need it and someone says, who has a caviar key and you pull it out and you have one on your key, it's like, that's badass. I don't really know if it's badass, but it sounds badass. But anyway, if you're in a restaurant that uses a lot of caviar, whoever you're buying your caviar from, most likely they could give you a little caviar key for your keychain. It's a good thing to have because nothing's worse than struggling to open up a tin of caviar when you need it. Having that caviar key on your keychain makes things easy, smooth, pop it open. No fuss, makes it easy, nice and smooth. Get yourself a caviar key on your keychain. You'll thank me later. Even if it only comes in handy once in your life, you'll thank me. The next tip, this is my green oil tip. So everyone has a different way to make green oil. Some people will tell you you got to cook it. Other people will tell you you have to blanch it. Whatever it is that you do, here's my secret. I go two, one, two parts oil, one part green. So for example, if you have 500 grams of the green, chives, basil, spinach, whatever it is that you're making the green oil out of, you will have 1,000 grams of oil, grapeseed, olive oil, whatever it is that you're making your green oil out of. So two to one, two parts oil, one part green. Don't forget that. That's the ratio. Put it in the Vitamix, turn it on high, set the timer for five minutes. It gets hot. When the five minutes are done, stop the beeping, turn off the blender, strain it through a coffee filter, a cheesecloth, something to make sure that you get all the impurities out. And what you'll notice is that the heat from the blender cooks the oil and it makes it super green. So that's my tip. Two to one, five minutes, super green oil, strain it. And then some people like to hang their green oil up in a, in a pastry bag so the water collects in the corner. That's up to you, depending on if you have the time or not. Another thing you could do if you make a lot of green oil is you could freeze them in cryovac bags when they cool down. So that way they're ready to go in the freezer. So again, that cryovac machine comes in handy again. But that's my tip. Super green oil. If you use that method, tag me. It's something that I learned from a chef that I had worked with years ago. Shout out to Alice Gonzalez, who taught me that recipe. And it's stuck with me ever since. The next one is if you're making stock and you're roasting bones, and if you have a rationale oven or a combi oven of some sort, a good tip is after you put your bones in the stock pot, you want to save that fond that's on the pan. And sometimes it's very difficult to scrape the fond off. So if you have a combi oven, Put your pans in the combi oven on steam. And what you'll end up doing is it'll soften the fond so that it makes it very easy to scrape off and put into the stock so you don't lose the fond. So if you got a Rationale, shout out to Rationale, or an Electrolux, or an Alto Sham, whatever you got, as long as you have a combi oven, turn it on steam, scrape the pans, it'll go a long way, it'll save you some time. And you won't lose that fond. The next tip is around my favorite vegetable, the artichoke. By the way, artichokes are like the final boss of vegetables because they're so difficult to clean. I've talked about this before. When I give cooking interviews for chefs, I always give them an artichoke because most chefs, it's like their Achilles heel. They've avoided artichokes or they have bought them in the can because they're difficult. And if you're not used to cleaning artichokes, it's one of those vegetables that you don't have a frame of reference really with any other vegetables. You can't, you could like cut a lot of potatoes and then understand how to cut other things that are shaped like that, but there's nothing else like an artichoke. It's so unique that Knowing how to cut an artichoke, you have to know how to cut an artichoke. There's no way around it. So here's a tip that I like for artichokes when you have to do a lot of them. And when I mean a lot of them, like I worked in a place where we had to do like 500 in a day and you had other shit to do. So you had to get them done quick and artichokes are difficult to clean. So what I like to do, and it doesn't yield the best artichoke, but it does yield a quicker product is if you're not going to go the traditional method of cleaning them, putting them in acidulated water or veg blanc like we talked about earlier and cooking them in some sort of cooking medium with acid or maybe you're making bar gold or whatever. If you need them done right away, you could cook them in advance in that same acidulated water whole. And the reason you cook them whole is they are much easier to clean after they're cooked. So then the leaves just come right off. It's easy to trim up the choke and the copa on the bottom and you end up with a nice looking artichoke. So again, that's not a one size fits all answer. Sometimes you don't want to do that. But if you're in a place that has to do a lot of artichokes, that's a good little trick is to cook them before you clean them. And it makes cleaning them much easier. The next one I want to talk about is a simple trick. But when I show people, it, they their mind seems to be blown. And that's how to properly use a scale. So I'm talking about the larger scales, not the small personal scales that a lot of cooks have. But in a lot of kitchens, you have larger digital scales and you use them to weigh things. So you're weighing lots of different portions. So let's just use this as an example. You are portioning individual kits of tomatoes, let's say, in little deli cups. And each one needs to be 
three ounces or whatever, right? 150 grams. What I see a lot of cooks do is they put one thing on, they put the tomatoes in, and then they take it off, done. And then they put the next one on, they put the tomatoes in, they, they take it off, done. A faster way to do that is put a tray on the scale, tear it so it goes to zero, and then put all your deli cups. So let's just say you're using a half sheet pan. Maybe you get a, I don't know, 10 deli cups on there, 10 portion cups. And then instead of taking one off every single time, you just three ounces, three ounces, three ounces, three ounces, three ounces, three ounces. And you minimize the amount of steps of going back and forth and resetting every single time. So I don't know why people think they have to do one thing at a time, but if you're, if you're busy and you need to work efficiently, weigh multiple things at once, just put a sheet pan, put a lot of deli cups on there and just add three ounces or add 150 or whatever the case may be. Or if you have time, hit the tear button every single time you do that, but no sense in taking it on and off every single time. So anyway, that's a little tip that'll save you time if you're working in a kitchen that has to weigh things on a scale and portion them out for kids. All right, this is the last tip I'm gonna talk about today. But if you have a meat grinder in your kitchen, it can be used for things other than meat. And one thing I like to use meat grinders for is vegetables. So you could put your mirepoix through the meat grinder to grind your onions, your carrots, your celery, if you're making a bolognese and you need that ground up very fine so it basically disintegrates in the sauce. If you're making a consomme and you need to grind up your mirepoix, same, same thing applies. You could grind it right through the meat grinder. If you're making a mushroom stock, one thing that I like to do is put the mushrooms through the meat grinder so it releases the flavor in the liquid much quicker. So that's a very quick way to make a vegetable stock. Put all your vegetables through the meat grinder, cover it in water, put a cartouche on top, let it simmer. It'll extract the flavor much more rapidly than if you chop everything up and just throw it in a pot. So that's a little pro tip. Grind your vegetables in advance before you use it for sauce or stocks or something like that. Like I said, you can make mushroom stock that way. You can make vegetable stock that way. You can make the grind for your bolognese that way much faster. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed those kitchen tips and tricks, the pro tips, just the tips. If I forgot something, make sure you leave a comment below. Tell us what you're doing in your kitchen. If you want to support the show, make sure you leave five stars. Nothing less than five stars. Hit the subscribe button. Go to chefspsa.com. You get the books. You get the merch. Free eBooks, and they're free, so you should have all of them. Or you could tip me. They don't have to be free. I, I like I like getting paid for things too. So see you all next week. Hit the porno music. 